Hello, everyone. Welcome to this very, very important, one of the most awaited part of our International Low Carb Awareness Week for 2023. This is the first ever this year, and hopefully we will be able to make a follow-up on the coming years. And today we will be enlightened as to the benefits of meat-based nutrition. We are graced with the presence of no other than Dr. Sean Baker. So Dr. Sean Baker, is an orthopedic surgeon, a military veteran, a lifelong athlete, an author, and co-founder of Rivero Health. So let's all welcome our dearest, Dr. Sean Baker. Hello, Doc. Hey, Grace, thank you for that welcome. That was very nice. Thanks. <laughs> I'm glad to be here and get to talk to some of the people, I guess, in the Philippines. So it'll be neat to yes. share some of this information. Yeah. Yeah, so we have an ongoing growing community of low carbers, and we started before with just eliminating simple carbs. And then eventually we moved on to elimination of uh, starches, like the big starch, especially if you know Asians, we are a big rice eaters and bread and pasta and pastries. But now we are actually removing all those. And I think after a while, we've been going on for about five years now, we also started seeing that as much as vegetables are low carb, lower in carbohydrate content, lower in sugar content, yet not everyone can actually tolerate so much of vegetables. I myself, as one of our experimentations in our family, one of there's at least two weeks that we did a vegan or vegetarian almost vegan diet for two weeks and we thought it's gonna be better but actually we felt worse and we never went to that road again and that's also around the same time i think it's going four years now that we also appreciated the benefit of mostly carnivore mostly meat-based eating as I say it, I just uh, say that we, if you are already satiated or saturated with all of these meat, then you can have some vegetables from time to time, but know that it may not be a requirement for you. Like you can really have a full health just mostly on meat-based eating. And I want to hear it from you being an author and a practitioner yourself. Uh, can you, we can discuss what are the different kinds or just few major concerns of people when it comes to meat-based nutrition and generally the benefits of meat-based nutrition. So if it's okay, can I ask you some questions, Dr. Sean? Oh, yes, of course. Yeah. Okay. So in a more practical and scripted sense, how can you describe carnivore diet or meat-based nutrition, especially for someone who is hearing this one for the first time? Yeah, well, I mean, many people kind of make it as a lifestyle they, or they do it for, you know, weight loss reasons or things like that. I, as a physician, tend to think of it as a therapeutic protocol. And I think that, you know, you should, people can, should consider, you know, if they're, if they're suffering from some sort of disease, I, I don't know how much obesity has started to affect the Philippines. I suspect it's probably increasing like, <clears throat> like it is around the rest of the world. And for things like autoimmune conditions, for things with digestive problems, even mental health disorders like depression, it's been very, very effective. And so I think for, you know, three to six months, something like that may be a good way to do this. Uh, what does a diet look like? Well, it's pretty much just animal products. You know, it's a lot of meat. It's like eggs. It might be seafood. It might be, um, you know, I don't know what's popular in the Philippines, but we do a lot of beef in the U.S. But I mean, you might find that there's more seafood or pork or things like that in the Philippines. Yes. And you can certainly do it with that. And so I think it's it's the concept is that uh, meat provides really, really high quality nutrition. We get very good, you know, very bio bioavailable, perfectly balanced protein sources. Uh, the fat, which contains all the fat soluble vitamins is very important. Meat also has, you know, I know, I know in particular beef, for instance, has something like 70,000, that's 70,000 individual nutritional components many of them including phytonutrients which we think well where are you going to get your phytonutrients that are in vegetables are actually in beef the animals tend to accumulate that and, and i'm sure in pork and, and and others it's it's not too different but um it is something that um people will use uh their as you probably recognize the benefits of a lower carb diet with regard to insulin sensitivity diabetes weight loss it has all those things but it also has been particularly, um, I think, 
I'll call it soothing to the gut in a way. It's very, it's very well tolerated on the gut for most people. Now there's some people that maybe the fat is something they have to have, they have to adjust to, but for the most part, uh, as opposed to, like you mentioned, a lot of vegetables, a vegetable heavy diet may in fact irritate because it causes bloating and there's a lot of discomfort that's, that's often attached to that. A lot of people don't tolerate that well. In fact, there's some recent studies just published looking at, for instance, colitis. You know, we see things like Crohn's disease, also colitis. Mm. Literally yesterday it came out there showing that fiber actually made that disease worse by its interaction on the gut microbiome. There's a, a particular mm-hmm. species of bacteria called uh, Musospirillum, uh, spirillium, mm-hmm. sorry, that leads to worse uh, Crohn's, Crohn's disease uh, flare-ups. And so there was also a study last year looking at rheumatoid arthritis, and they showed that higher fiber diets actually made rheumatoid arthritis worse, again, through a through the mechanism through a gut bacteria called Prevotella. Mm-hmm. So there are, you know, a number of reasons why you might want to do this. Um, I tell people, you know, do it as long until you fix yourself and then you can kind of figure where you want to go from there. But it's a very, mm-hmm. uh, it's a very powerful elimination diet at its very yeah. base. And I think that's where it should be primarily used. Some people enjoy it so much because they just, they just enjoy it and they continue to do it for many years. In fact, myself, I've been on doing it for eight years and wow. I am still here and I'm still doing well. <laughs> and I haven't got any, any health issues, you know, basically mm-hmm. I've, been, I've been able to do uh, this very successfully and, uh, and, and quite honestly, I quite enjoy it. So it's, it's fun. I know there's a lot of people say, well, what about the, the rice and the pa- the desserts and the vegetables that they like? And interestingly, many people find that after, you know, a month or two on it, you don't want that stuff anymore. It's really weird is you, you just don't want those other foods because many people are addicted to these foods. And I know that probably, you know, food is probably very important to the, to the culture there. And, you know, there's a lot of people that like to eat a lot, <laughs> like to eat quite frequently. And so, you know, trying to try to figure that out socially can be challenging for sure, but you can make it work. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Sean. I, I agree with all of those things that you said, and I can really remember the time that when we were doing that two week, almost a plant based eating, I think it's really 100 percent plant based eating. We really felt bloated. And I, it made me recall the time that when I was not conscious about how we eat, it's already normal for me to have that stomach ache in the morning when I wake up. But now, since we've, I consider it as clean eating, which is 80 to 90% running, 100% of that mostly in many days that we do meat-based eating, we actually didn't feel any of those stomach ache anymore. So I guess that leaky gut problem, that, that uh, problem in the gut, really, the IBD, irritable bowel diseases, irritable bowel syndrome are already causing so much after accumulation of, of course, not just not the vegetables. I feel like, correct me if I'm wrong, I feel like it's really not the one that's causing it. It's actually part of those, all of those processed food combined and all of those inflammatory food that even these vegetables and fibers eventually our gut can no longer take it anymore. So I consider meat-based eating as one of my resetting kind of food that when I don't feel so good, I will go to clean meat-based eating. Yes, beef, we also have beef here, but beef here in the Philippines is quite chunkier and quite tougher. I think it's the toughest beef in the world. And also pork, seafood, eggs, all of that. And when we usually go back to that kind of eating, we feel a lot better. We feel lighter. We feel satisfied, but not heavy satisfied, like the one that you get when you eat all of those other foods, especially carbs. And I'm so grateful that you're able to enlighten us. But it made me curious. You said you are already on meat-based eating for eight years now. So what started your journey from the typical standard American diet, what we call a sad diet into a low carb meat based or carnivore kind of lifestyle? Yeah, well, I'm so I'm now uh, 50, it's going to be 57 years of age. And back when I was in my early 40s, I had noticed I was just putting on weight, I wasn't feeling good, I probably was developing uh, metabolic syndrome. And I didn't really like that. So I said, well, I'm going to I was an athlete, so I was already training very hard. I was exercising every day and doing very, very aggressive exercise. In fact, I was a world champion athlete, but I was developing metabolic wow. disease. And I didn't like that. And so I started to start to look more into nutrition. And so the initial thing I did, and this is back, you know, 2012, maybe, you know, 10 years, 12 years ago, um, I reduced my fat. 
I ate a lot of vegetables. I ate lean protein and I did lose weight. I did lose weight, but I felt miserable. I was hungry, mm. tired, irritable. Uh, I was, I was just, it, well, it just didn't work for me. I couldn't sustain it. And so then I, then I progressed through various different versions of a paleo diet and then low carb keto uh, over about the next five or six years. And then I discovered these sort of crazy people eating nothing but meat, which I thought was really crazy at the time. I really did. And, but, but I was, I was, I was curious. And so I kind of just kind of followed along for about six months. And finally I'd seen enough to say, well, let me try this and just see. Mm -hmm. And so I started out just, I just had one meal. It was like one, I'm going to have steak and eggs for one meal. And I ate it and I was like, oh, that's pretty good. I like it. I enjoyed it. And I felt okay. And then I did a day and then two days and then three days and then a week and two weeks. And finally I did a month of it straight. And by the end of the month, I was like, this is the best I've felt in a long time. I've not, I can't remember oh. feeling this good. I felt like I was, you know, 10, 20 years younger, mm -hmm. uh, with regard to how I felt. And so at the end of the month, I said, well, that was a month experiment. Let me go back to my regular sort of mixed omnivorous diet. And I immediately felt worse. I was just like, well, my, I, my stomach didn't feel good. I started having aches and pains. And so I realized that I'd rather feel good because you know, at that time I was almost 50. And uh, so I, I went back on the meat-based diet. And I've been on that ever since that time. And since that time, I was able to break world records as an athlete. And I've been able to just you know, do really, you know, have really good health, I think, for someone in their 50s, you know, particularly compared to the people around me in their 50s. A lot yes. of them, if you, if you haven't been to America lately, the USA has got a lot of people that are really, really sick, and it's unfortunate. And, it's, and, it, and to your to your point, it is all this hyper-processed food, the sugary stuff, the highly refined grains, the, the shelf-stable stuff with all the, 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 the different chemicals and preservatives and thickening agents and emulsifiers and stabilizers. It's, it's just garbage. Yeah. that we eat so much of and it destroys our gut in a way and i think the carnivore does reset that uh, in a very powerful way uh and so that's kind of my how i kind of do this and of course literally hundreds of thousands of people have now done this and we're all seeing yes with with rare exception quite good results so it's kind of interesting to watch this sort of develop as it grows and it's becoming kind of a uh, you know, it's, it's you know, like I said, I'm it's talking a movement. To you the, I'm, yeah, I've, I've been talking to you in the Philippines <laughs> last week. I was talking to India, and then I was in Germany last. I was in Germany last week for a conference. Just going around the world, it's growing mm. tremendously, and uh, it, it, it's 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 really just fun to watch this grow. As as you know, I was one of the guys that kind of maybe uh, as far as yes. calling it a carnivore diet, I was a guy. I was a guy that came up with that, and <laughs> it's, it's it's grown pretty interestingly. It's been fun to watch. Thank you so much. And I think I would like to make a shout out in one of the Facebook groups that I, I first came in contact a few years ago, the World Carnivore Tribe. I think you're familiar with that. And there's there are a lot of testimonials every day, day in, day out of people really going into this diet after experimenting with so much more. And I think you as a doctor yourself, we've been critical we've been doubtful at first and before we jumped into carnivore we also followed the dietary guidelines to lessen fat lessen meat lessen red meat lessen salt and all of those things and we just see ourselves not doing so well with it we didn't feel any good and i think that's the time that our instinct to listen to our body kicked in and not just listen to what these suggestions are usually saying that we've been following also with our patients. So thank you so much for that, Dr. John. And I believe since then you were also, since you see yourself benefiting from it and it's like at no odd added cost at all, you can see, you can just stop yourself from helping others as well. Like extending this, this knowledge to your patients first before you shared this to the whole world. So can I ask what, which are the top five conditions you see in your practice who can benefit the most from meat-based diet or meat-based lifestyle? Uh, well, I think, you know, again, the, the things that we see more commonly are the, the things I've seen the most success with. So number one, obesity. I mean, there's a lot of, in the United States, 70% of our population is overweight or obese. We got 42% obesity rate. So it's helped that tremendously. It has helped with, uh, believe it or not, arthritis. A lot of people, you know, when, they, when they're inflammatory, their systematic, their systemic inflammation goes away. A lot of times they feel better. Their joints feel better. So, and it, so uh, that is, that is occurring. 25% of our population has mental health issues. And so it also helps with mental health, whether it's depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, even things like post-traumatic stress disorder seem to get relief from that. Uh, we see people with all kinds of digestive issues where, it, whether it's 
Uh, IBS, also known as you know irritable bowel syndrome, or in, in fact IBD, which would be the, the inflammatory bowel disorders mm -hmm. like Crohn's disease or, or also colitis, that's been wonderfully successful. Uh, many of the autoimmune conditions, psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, even multiple sclerosis, we see we we seen benefit with that. Um, you know, like the like I said, so I mentioned some of the skin disorders like psoriasis, eczema. Uh, we see um, blood pressure, you know, these cardiometabolic factors. Diabetes is a huge one. I mean, we see people that are diabetic that are, you know, A1Cs of 10, 12, 14. Uh, within a few months on carnivore, they've, they've almost normalized their blood glucose. I mean, mm -hmm. they, they come back with a normal hemoglobin A1C. They've, they've come off so many of their medications. In fact, the study that Harvard University did on this diet back in 2021 showed that of the 225 diabetics that were in the, in the cohort, um, 92% of them were, to, were able to come off all insulin, you know, which is remarkable. Mm -hmm. And and 100% wow. came off all the other injectable medications like the, uh, uh, you know, the S GLT2 inhibitors or the uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists. And then 84% came off all the, even the oral medications like metformin. So we're seeing tremendous success across the board with just, a, I hate to make it as a panacea, but just about every medical condition out there will benefit from better nutrition. That's clear. And a carnivore diet, in my view, is very good nutrition. And so I think it helps just about any condition out there. Um, but yeah, the, the ones that are more common are the ones we see more and more success with just because we see so much of it. So, but we've seen some really weird ones, you know, like, like Ehlers-Danlos mm -hmm. syndrome, which is a connective tissue disorder. I had a patient who was uh, another physician, he, an emergency room physician, and she would wake up every day with her joints displaced out of, you know, joints dislocated, her ankle was dislocated, her shoulder was dislocated, her wrist was dislocated. Every morning she'd wake up because at night she'd turn and all of her joints would dislocate. And so she'd start a day that way. And then she'd go to the emergency room to work and half the time her shoulder would fall out of place or something like that. So it was really, you can imagine, that's kind of a little of a nightmare scenario. She went carnivore within a month. She stopped having dislocations. It's like they just stopped dislocating. And then she started able to start going to the gym and working out and lost weight and got stronger. That's interesting. There's something called Tourette syndrome, which is another interesting uh, disorder where, you know, you have these weird vocalizations, you know, these, these weird sounds come out of your mouth. And sometimes you make swear words and weird facial tics and motor things that went away on carnivore. So, I mean, I've seen some really incredible things that I didn't expect because you know, these are all genetic mm -hmm. disorders in many cases, or at least other mm -hmm. is that actually get better with this. So in my view, really any condition out there, I don't care what it is, whether it's cancer, <laughs> dementia, diabetes, Better nutrition is almost always going to help. And I think in my view, a meat-based diet is, is some of the best nutrition you can get. Yes. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Sean. And I agree there. There's one this one time that I was the referring consultant, although I practice as a surgeon, but I have this orphanage where I'm the one that's clearing the kids, uh, doing their annual checkups. And there's this kid who... Uh, just have a very weak week. Uh, I th I I suspected that he had an a problem with his adrenals, and then without because this was in the province and there was no available laboratories to confirm that. So I just said I, I just asked what the usual diet of the kid, and then just by elimination, if he hadn't tried mostly meat based eating he would just try it and then the nurse followed up after a month he's doing so well the lumps in his legs already shrink and then he's playing already just like a regular kid and there's also this one girl i met having problem with fertility and already failed a lot with ivf and then he, because I'm also pregnant right now after a miscarriage and immediately after I get pregnant. So she I just asked what I did. And I just said that I just eat mostly carnivore, mostly meat. And she also did the same. And in a few months time, she got back to me and said she's already pregnant as well. So yes, these <laughs> illness are the ones that we see commonly in our practice. And I think by number these are the most uh issues that people are actually dealing right now but practic practically any illness at all if you haven't tried carnivore way of eating meat-based eating then it's really worth the try and you can see yourself you can feel yourself all the difference so thank you for that dr sean and since these patients and especially the ones who are watching us right now 
would be a little scared of the many other issues that we've been bombarded ever since we were young, or I think we've been brainwashed to fear red meat over the last 10, 20 years. One of the the major concerns of people are those with when it comes to our kidney function. So for those with kidney problems and hyperuricemic state, what are their options? You think they can also do meat-based? Should there be different macronutrient proportions? Should they lower their protein content and eat mostly of the fatty content? What are your take on this? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, when we look at why do we have kidneys that are failing? You know, we see people with chronic renal insufficiency, you know, chronic kidney disease, whatever you want to call it. Um, often um, the assumption is that protein has something to do with that. Well, we know that on further testing, this comes from back from a, a hypothesis that was generated back in the 1980s by a guy named Dr. Brenner. And that data, data was all basically secured on animal studies, particularly like mice and rats. And so in human studies, however, when you actually do trials and not just because there's epidemiologic studies that suggest that higher protein diets are, are associated with uh, uh, renal disease, but there's a lot of confounders in that. And when you actually do the trials on that, and Stuart Phillips in 2018 did a really nice paper looking at you know all the data on uh, higher protein diets and kidney disease and showed that higher protein diets really don't have any sort of negative impact on the kidney. So I don't think you need to dial back the, the protein. What they are seeing, and David Unwin, who's a friend of mine, who's a GP in the, uh, in the UK, has published a nice series on patients that were diabetic, that had kidney disease, and he put them on higher protein animal-based low-carb diets, and guess what? Their kidney disease got better. It actually got improved significantly. And I've seen that clinically in my observations with many, many patients as well. And so it's really cutting out, like we mentioned earlier, the ultra-processed food, the refined grains, the sugary products, the things that tend to lead to hyperglycemia that's really going to make the biggest impact on your uh, renal function. The other thing is how do we assess renal function. I think one of the problems is we often use what's called a creatinine based Mm -hmm. assessment. We often get a, you know, basic chemistry panel and has a serum creatinine and we calculate something called a GFR, glomerular filtration rate, which is an estimate. The problem with that test is if you're eating a high protein diet or if you're working out hard or if you have a lot of muscle mass, it's going to be artificially elevated. Now the the way around that is to do a different test called cystatin C, which I don't know how widely available is in in the Philippines, but it's, it's, it's a far superior test and it will show you like, for instance, when I check my own personal, cause I'm, I'm a big guy, I got a lot of muscle. I work out all the time, eat a lot of protein. My GFR is always low based on serum creatinine, but every time I test it using cystatin C, it shows it's normal. It's normal range. And so it's, mm-hmm. one is it's not having the right measurement tool. Now, the second part of the question mm-hmm. talks about hyperuricemia. And so what is the main thing we worry about when we think about u- u- uric acid is gout is, is a clinical manifestation. Um, and so what I typically see if someone is, 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 is suffering from gout or hyperuricemic, it's usually in, in, it's usually become symptomatic in the context of metabolic disease. You know, usually most people that have gouty flare-ups also have something going on metabolically, whether it's pre-diabetes or insulin resistance, or maybe diabetes, metabolic syndrome, something like that usually precedes that or is, or is associated with that. And so typically what we see is as you go on a meat-based diet, those metabolic parameters get better. The, the, the hyperglycemia normalizes, the inflammation goes down. And so the uric acid becomes less of a problem. Uric acid, you know, what is the role of uric acid in the body? Why do we have it? What's well, an antioxidant? I mean, uric acid is, an, is one of the most abundant antioxidants we have in the body. So we need uric acid. Now, sometimes when it's elevated and all these other factors, the, the metabolic factors, the immune system factors are, you know, in the right, in the, in the, in the, in the, the appropriate uh, levels, then we get things like gout, which are a problem. And so I don't think hyperuricemia is a contraindication to a, a carnivore diet. Now, initially, if somebody is really metabolic, let's say they're bad diabetic or something like that, initially going carnivore, they may have a flare up and you would treat that as you would normally. You know, typically we use things like alpurinol, colchicine, or some kind of anti inflammatory. Um, as, as a main front line for these medications, but usually over time, two months, three months, four months, six months, that all goes away. And most people, long-term carnivore, even if they started out with gout, it, 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 it improves and goes away. And my, you know, for, for just for refer, reference, I eat, <laughs> I know this will sound kind of crazy, you guys, but I eat probably some days, one and a half to two kilos of beef a day. It's a lot of food, right? My uric acid is typically normal. You know, it's just, it, it runs, you know, 
uh, normal range. It never goes high unless unless I test it like right after, immediately after I eat, then it, then it may be bumped up a little bit because I had a home uric acid meter that I played with for a little while. But um, really, I think it's more that concern about hyperuricemia and really kidney kidney disease is really based upon metabolic disease. It's, it's, it's the things that lead to metabolic syndrome, which as you probably are aware, it's obesity, it's hyperglycemia, it's low HDL, uh, you know, high triglycerides, uh, and hypertension. I mean, that's, that's sort of the, the metabolic syndrome picture. Uh, and so if you can, if you can fix all those things, generally those issues, the kidney disease, the, 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 t- the t- tendency to gout and inflammation go away. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Sean. I would just like to clarify uh, what you said when it comes to GFR measurement. So for those who are not aware, it's the glomerular filtration rate. Usually that's the one that we try to calculate as to check how the kidney are functioning. As you know, our kidney is just like a filter for our body. So it filters everything. And as what I always say, the these things are not really the perfect, especially creatinine. It's not the perfect uh, measurement because these are just the byproducts. But what you can really see when it comes to your kidneys may be something else. So, but in it, make it just a little easier for our audience. Would you consider cystatin, cystatin C better gauge when it comes to kidney function rather than creatinine? Well, I think in the context of a higher protein diet, yes, cystatin C would be a much a more, protein. it would be a much better way better to do gauge. that. Like oh, said, okay. if, you use, if you use creatinine in a, in a high protein context, it could be that the kidneys are failing or it could just because you're eating high protein, it's hard to discern. Yes. Yes. So you need to verify that. And again, as, as you mentioned, EGFR is an estimate. It's not an actual true yes. measurement. It's just an estimate yes. based on these other biomarkers. If you want to really measure your, uh, your, uh, you know, uh, GFR, then there's ways to do that. There's, you know, you can do like, I think it's inulin challenges There's things that nephrologists will do to actually measure it. Sometimes it requires a 24 hour urine collection, but again, a cystatin season, a quick, easy way to, cause, cause if you got a patient that, you know, their, their creatinine is bumped because they went on a high protein diet and you're worried about it, Rather than tell them to stop eating protein or send them to a nephrologist, just get us a sat and see, and you can clear it up pretty quickly. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Sean. And before we proceed, can I just ask another again when it comes to kidney function? Because as you said, uh, you are not sure if Philippines has a lot of obesity. You are right. There's not much obese in the Philippines, but the problem is in here, there are so many who are suffering from metabolic syndrome, metabolic illness, insulin resistance, and its outcome and its complications, that there are so many dialysis centers everywhere you go, even in a place where it's already somewhat far flung from the city, there's already a dialysis center coming up because there's just so many. I just learned that my 30-year-old cousin is already on dialysis two to three times a week. Imagine, imagine that one. We were we weren't able to recognize him the last time we saw him. So these things is no longer surprising here in the Philippines. And these people are not actually obese. They are thin, they look fit, they look normal, 20s, 25 years old, they're already on dialysis. So uh, as much as when it comes to these concerns, especially the ones who are not yet aware, they are really afraid. They are almost not eating proteins at all. Although CKD five may be considered as really irreversible, although I really don't lose hope because I know as long as we have at least twenty percent of kidney function, we can still function well. Mm, w- would you consider avoidance of protein at all beneficial for these cases? Because from what I've read, it could actually worsen with, with their condition right now. Well, I mean, if you have to look, if you have to look at what got them there in the first place, and as you yes. mentioned, uh, in the Philippines, probably people eating lots and lots of protein is probably not a thing. It's probably they're consuming a lot of refined carbohydrates. Carbs, and you yeah. mentioned lots of rice, probably lots of sweets and things Processed like that. Foods. So mm-hmm. those are the things that are actually driving the disease. And I think mm-hmm. that even a patient on dialysis could do a meat-based diet. In my view, mm-hmm. I mean, you're, you know, obviously you're going to, you're still on dialysis, but I, I've, you know, literally seen people go from, you know, you know, certainly three, two and one back to normal, whether somebody could go from five to, to, mm-hmm. to class two or three is, is, is potentially wow. interesting. Um, you know, the thought is that um, protein 
causes hyperfiltration or stresses the kidney out and the kidney has to sort of adapt to that. And I look at the way that, you know, and, and a lot of times we'll see people that are on higher protein diets have bigger kidneys. Their kidneys just get bigger, mm-hmm. right? There's more tissue that, that devolves that. It's kind of like exercising to get bigger muscles. And, you know, you would tell, you would say, well, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you know, and you know, what happens when we look at older people, right? When we look at older people and we do a CT scan or an MRI on an older person, everything has shrunken down. The kidneys have shrunk, the brain has shrunk, the bones have become osteoporotic, the muscles mm-hmm. have shrunk, the skin has thinned out. So we want robust, thick, strong organs, just like we want big, strong bones and big, strong muscles. That is a better way to be. So I don't think even somebody with CKD5, you know, chronic kidney disease, you know, class five, I think they could benefit from one, eliminating all the processed food at the, at the very least. And maybe, you know, maybe initially you, you kind of moderate the protein a little bit, maybe, maybe switch to a little bit more of a fat macronutrient comp- composition, yes. but you know, gosh, I mean, the big problem is not the meat. It's not the protein. It is the, the ultra processed food. It's the sugary stuff. That's what's killing. And that's what's killing the kidneys in almost, you know, every case with rare exception. I couldn't agree more uh, with I've handled cases also with CKD and I've seen seen the same from CKD3 to coming back to one CKD5 uh, from dialysis of almost every other day. It's now down to just twice a week or sometimes just once a week. There are those kinds of improvement, but I never promised anyone, especially that you cannot really be there to check what they're eating, that they can really comply with it. But what I say is it's not the meat that really gotten you into that situation. And even if you are on dialysis, say, for example, it's already a given that your kidneys are zero functioning, no longer functioning, then so be it. Your kidneys are no longer functioning and it's now being replaced by the dialysis machine. But it doesn't mean you no longer have the other vital organs that you should protect. It's just that all of those inflammatory foods, junk foods that you've been eating, carbs, damage your kidney first. But it doesn't mean it will stop there. If you continue eating junk while you're on dialysis, it's just a matter of time that it will also reach your brain, reach your heart, reach your liver. That's why people on dialysis seldom die of of increased metabolites from the failure of dialysis or the kidneys function. But they still die of heart attack, still die of stroke, still die of the same complications, not directly related to kidneys, but related to their overall metabolic unhealth. Would you agree with that, Dr. Sean? Yeah, I mean, whatever is destroying your kidneys is destroying the rest of your body. And I mean, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but the life expectancy of somebody on dialysis is often three years, five years, something like that. You don't live long once you're on dialysis. It may, it may be longer now, but I mean, it used to be if somebody got a di- dialysis, yes. they were likely going to pass away within a few years. And so mm-hmm. um, absolutely, you know, I mean, you, you know, you're going to go blind, you're going to lose limbs, you're going to have a heart attack, you're going to, you know, all the, all the, you know, dementia, all these things that uh, are associated with, with this. And this is, and, and as you mentioned in, in, in the Philippines and like a lot of places in Asia and perhaps we see a tremendous amount of metabolic disease, diabetes, heart disease associated with that without a lot of obesity. And I think that's just a genetic difference. You don't have to put on too much weight. We see like men, they get just a little bit of a belly, not much, and they're very, very sick. Whereas in the United yes. States, we have people that are huge. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I think it has to do, you know, I think there's, there's thoughts on, you know, where genetically we, were, we arose. Yes. And, you know, maybe if we were from a cold climate, we needed more, we could tolerate more mm-hmm. fat. Whereas if you're in a warm climate where the Philippines obviously is tr- kind of right. tropical, probably genetically, you just don't tolerate as much fat. And you, if you get even a little bit fat, you're going to have problems metabolically. Thank you so much, Dr. Sean. Yes, that's what we call tofi, I think. That's thin yeah. outside, but Down fat inside. inside. Right, right, yeah, right. and what I see in my practice also, as much as we thought these non-fat formers are at advantage, but what with what I can see, they're actually more prone to inflammation. They are more prone to insulin resistance and its side effects because they don't have this much leeway to accommodate all of this insulin drive becoming making it into fats as compared to those living in a colder countries. Here in the Philippines, seldom you see obese patients, but these people who are thin 
looking slim with a little bulge in the belly actually have a lot of problems for women infertility uh, aches and pains dysmenorrhea allergies uh, flare-ups of of skin problems asthma tumors they are prone in tumor formation anywhere in their body so i think it's not just enough for people to consider that if you want a healthier lifestyle you just want to lose weight because not everybody puts on weight when they are getting sick some just get sick without putting on weight so thank you so much for that dr sean before we end i know it's already taking so much of your time but can you please enlighten us do you have some quick cheat sheet on the major do's and don'ts in meat-based nutrition that any beginner should be mindful about uh, so that we can just have a takeaway when we go proceed with possibly in this way of life as you yeah, go yeah. Along. so i think it's helpful to have some to be in a supportive environment so get friends family on board that will su support you in this or have an online community or something like that's incredibly important I think the other thing is you have to enjoy what you're eating. I mean, you will never stick oh. to any kind of nutritional program if you don't enjoy the food or if, you, if you're hungry all the time. So you got to eat sufficiently. You got to eat enough to, you know, keep off the cravings because a lot of people have cravings for some kind of sugary thing and you've got to eat enough. And so I say eat, eat like it's your job and your job is to, to overcome all these cravings and addictions. So I think that's important. The other thing is make sure you stay on top of your hydration because whenever you go low oh. carb or higher protein, you're going to need you know, basically more water, more fluid and fluid is both water, but also electrolytes. So electrolytes are what keeps the water in our body. You know, if we just drink pure distilled water, we're just going to urinate it right back out, you know, very quickly. And so we've got to make sure we're, we're staying hydrated. Um, be mindful of the fact that your bowel habits will change. I mean, when you come, when you go on a meat-based diet, you absorb everything, you know, your everything gets absorbed mm -hmm. in your small intestine. So you're going to go to the bathroom less. It's not that you're constipated or anything like that. It's just that you just don't have as much waste to get rid of. And so you just have to be mindful of that. Um, I think it's important to, um, you know, just engage in, you know, <laughs> well, one thing I will tell you is, you know, if, if you have a, a choice when, on when you eat your meals, I would refrain from eating a big protein filled meal close to bedtime because that's going to be, it's probably going to make it difficult for you to sleep because you have to deal with the nitrogen. Mm -hmm. You know, we, when we consume protein, our body has to deal with the nitrogen and we break, mm -hmm. you know, we, we first, we, we kind of break down the amino acids into their carbon skeletons and the nitrogen is converted into ammonia, which is actually toxic. And unfortunately we quickly convert it into the liver to something called urea and then we excrete it. And so uh, during the daytime, it's fine. If you eat a big protein breakfast, you might have to go to the bathroom, you know, once or twice during the day, you get rid of that. But if, but if you do it at night, then you're going to end up waking up in the middle of the night. You're not going to get good sleep. If you don't get good sleep, then, you know, you don't feel as good. You're more insulin resistant and on and on and on. So it's, it's important to, you know, time your meals appropriately, eat enough. Um, I tell people just eat whenever you're hungry. If you're not hungry, don't, you don't need to eat. Um, I think in general, uh, I'm, I tend to be a little bit heavier on the protein just because I think I'm, I'm so, um, I'm, I'm such a proponent of having muscle and having lean mass. And I think that's important. So I like people to get around, you know, up to maybe a, a, you know, you guys, you guys think in kilograms over there in the Philippines. So I believe correct. So I think, you know, maybe you want, you know, 1.2 to 1.6, maybe two grams mm -hmm. of protein per, per yeah, uh, body weight body of weight. kilograms. Right. So if you're, if you're 50 kilograms and you probably need to have, you know, maybe a hundred grams of protein a day, or maybe 75, mm -hmm. something like that. That's, that, that, that's, that's a target to shoot for. Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Sean. I'm so amazed. And it just reaffirms my initial idea that even if we didn't practice at all, we'll be speaking the same language because how we see nutrition now compared to how we see nutrition back in medical school or back in the traditional medical training is really different. So I would like to emphasize those things that you mentioned. So get everyone on board. So as much as possible, make it inclusive, even because in here, especially that so many people are still close minded, we are trying to open up. So but we want we don't want people to isolate themselves. We want to actually help them inspire their families, inspire others, make them see that it's working on you and it's hopefully going to work for them as well. So so that your process, your journey will be a pleasurable one. So you enjoy it. You eat enough because there are so many right now who have eliminated their carbs when they did low carb. 
but they saw muscle wasting, especially in the elderly. So that's their primary problem right now. So what I usually tell them, you are just not eating enough. And if you want to bulk up, try to bulk up on your muscle. Don't try to go back to bulk up with just fats and inflammation and just water retention in your body. And yes, hydration is very important, not just water, because what I say is when we go on lower glucose, lower sugar, lower insulin load in our body, we have this tendency to not retain water anymore. So we tend to urinate them. And it's not a bad thing. We just need to replenish them. And when we urinate, it's not just water that goes away, but also electrolytes. So make sure you have your electrolytes on, especially salt, and be mindful of bowel movement because they're actually scared that they're not pooping as often anymore. And I tell them that it's actually a good, a good thing. It means you're not eating so much garbage anymore. Most of the food that you're eating are actually being absorbed in your, in your gut. So you don't need to force it. It will just come to you. And I'm glad that you mentioned the avoid big protein meal at night. And I want to emphasize that it's just the big protein meal because I saw also that when you don't eat any protein at all, it, it's mostly just fatty food, you'll really be pumped up. Your ketones will be so high at night that you also have insomnia. So just an appropriate amount of protein, a lower amount when it comes to when you compare it to your daytime protein would actually be enough. I find that a bigger amount of protein in breakfast or your brunch, usually we do brunch because we do intermittent fasting as well. And our second meal would be a little lighter, but still protein rich. Uh, can you recommend, Dr. Sean, like say, for example, 30 grams of protein at bedtime, at nighttime or dinner? Would that already be enough? Uh, yeah, I mean, I suspect for most people, again, um, I, I probably put it in context. For me. I, I put it in context for me. It wouldn't be enough for me, but <laughs> okay. for, you know, someone yeah. someone from, from maybe your size or something like that, yeah, that, would, that should probably be more than sufficient, I think. Yes. And I also want to emphasize that at minimum, just like what you said, I think 50 kilogram weight on average is already quite small, but uh, it's an average Filipino weight. I already, I am also a little bigger as compared to usual Filipinos, but 50 gram, if you multiply that by two grams, so that's 100 gram of protein in a day. So I want to emphasize that it's not 100 gram of weight per se, of dry weight of the raw meat. It's actually about half kilo if it's like um, meat, if it's like, uh, say, for example, chicken breast or pure meat, because the raw weight is not equivalent to its protein component. So people thought before that when they go on these uh, protein measurements, that they'll be measuring because the standard measurement is in matchbox sizes, and it's really, really small. So that's why even if you're just 50 kilogram weight, you can actually accommodate roughly around 400 to 500 grams of raw meat weight when it comes to your daily protein requirements. Yeah, yeah, meat is about 70% water. I mean, so you remember most of it's water. <laughs> so you know, that, that, you got yeah, exactly you're exactly right. Yeah, but about about a half a kilo of meat is about 100 grams of protein give or take depending on how lean yes. it is. But yeah, that's a pretty good yes. estimate, sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Sean. Before we end, uh, can I have just a few more questions? Just a little more. Like, sure, say, for sure, example, yeah. uh, there are those concerns that what about the vitamins that we only get from plants? Do you do what, like vitamin C or all of these other considered as important uh, macronutrient, micronutrients from plants? Do you need supplements in this way of life? And is this important or temporary only for healing? Or would you recommend it to be to become a lifestyle that people can actually go to if they want to. Yeah. I mean, certainly I have no problem with someone doing it as a lifestyle. Like I said, I think it's main utility quite honestly is a, is a therapeutic right. protocol, but as far as the, 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 the concern about, you know, am I getting different nutrients from plants that I don't get in meat? The short answer is we're not clinically seeing any significant level of deficiency in people doing a meat based diet. Um, what I will mention, and I can't remember if I mentioned this or not, but we know that meat, uh, and I, I've got the literature on beef cause that's what I, that's what I, generally yes. tend to look at but because an animal will graze and they have a much 
more diverse plant-based palate than we can consume. Like, you know, cows can, out, can go out there and eat grass and different weeds and different leaves that we, we would, they would kill us if we ate them. So they have a much more robust level of nutrition and they're exposed to these phytonutrients. And actually many of those, most of those phytonutrients actually get into the meat. And we don't usually consider that, but, but I, I, again, Stephen, Stephen Van Vliet at, at who formerly was at Duke University, he's not Utah State, has done extensive testing on this and shows that meat actually has a lot of those phytonutrients in there. And the other thing is, is they tend to be more bioavailable, just like meat is more bioavailable in general, because a lot of the fiber that's that that that, that we consume, like you mentioned about going to the bathroom, if you eat a big plant-based diet, you're going to go to the bathroom a whole bunch. But guess what? That's because all that nutrition is going into your toilet. <laughs> you're not even absorbing it. So you you tend to absorb even the plant-based compounds that are found in the cow's tissues or the pig's tissue or whatever animal you're eating is going to make it into your body. And we just don't, mm-hmm. it's just something that we haven't had the, the ability to test for those things for so long. But now that we have high-level testing, metabolomic profiling and things like that, we can see that these meat, you know, these animals actually have all these plant nutritions, nutrients in them. So you don't need, I don't think you need to generally supplement for most people, unless you have some sort of known deficiency or some absorptive problem, maybe a pernicious anemia, or you've, maybe you've had surgery and you're missing parts of your stomach. And, you know, if you had a bypass or we don't, I don't know they do that much in the Philippines, but in the, for the most part, I don't think so. I think the only supplement that I think may be beneficial is just getting adequate electrolytes. And sometimes if, you know, particularly if you're sweating a lot, if you exercise a lot, you know, the mm-hmm. Philippines is obviously a warm humid environment so people are probably sweating quite a bit so you might have to stay on top of your electrolytes in that that regard but other than that i don't really see a great need for any kind of supplementation thank you so much dr sean when it comes to electrolytes because some, most of our viewers are actually no longer beginners when it comes to low carb nutrition can i can we ask what were the components of your electrolytes if ever you're taking it uh well so i have this there's a commercial product called it's called Element or LMNT, and it, it comes pre-prepared with 1,000 milligrams of sodium, and I think it's 200 milligrams of potassium, and 60 milligrams of magnesium, the way it, it's formulated. Um, and so I, I, sometimes, I, I exercise quite a bit. I'm always kind of sweating and doing that. So I do that. But, you know, but, but let's go back. You, know, you think about it, you know, the people that grew up in the Philippines 200 years ago, they didn't have any supplements. They had none. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, how did, how did you survive? So it's kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. We, we can do fine without supplements, mm-hmm. I think. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Sean. It's be, this has been a very enlightening day for all of us. And we thank you for your time. And before we end, uh, can we ask where we can possibly see most of your work, where we can read your work, or where can people follow you so that they know where to learn more if they want to? Uh, well, sure. I mean, well, I wrote a book called The Carnivore Diet. Uh, it's unfortunately, it's in English. So it's, you know, it's not in Tagalog okay. or whatever, you know, there's only, <laughs> it's, you have to, you know, it's in English. It's, they're, they're, they're translating it. I think they're translating it into other, other, other languages right now, but The, the Carnivore mm-hmm. Diet by Sean Baker, MD is uh, mm-hmm. the book I wrote that I think is a very good overview of this. I think it's, it's, I think it's a fundamental book that, that people that do this have found a lot of, and it's easy to read. I wrote it intentionally. So it'd be easy to read. Uh, I have some social media. I'm on YouTube at Sean Baker, MD. I'm on uh, Instagram, if you like that one, at Sean Baker, 1967. That's the year I was born. Uh, I'm on Twitter, or what's now called X, uh, at S Baker MD. Um, and let's see, I, the World Carnivore Tribe that you mentioned, that is my, my. I started that group, but I don't, I don't really spend a lot of time on Facebook. I just, I've never been a fan of Facebook. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, Rivero is, you know, Rivero or Carnivore.diet. We have a lot of international people in there. And so, like, we have people that come in there to learn about carnivore and get a supportive community. As I mentioned, it's, it's important to have a supportive environment. And so if you don't have any in the family or friends that are going to support you, come on over to our community and we'll, we'll, we'll be happy to have you there and, you know, help you out. So anyway. Thank you so much, Dr. Sean. So this episode is actually for, in celebration of our International Low Carb Awareness Week, ILCAO 2023. And this is being streamed from December 1 to December 7. But you can also rewatch it anytime you like. This will be available in our YouTube channel, Facebook, Twitter, and also on our website. So thank you so much, Dr. Sean. We actually encourage others to help others inspire as well by making a one-minute video answering how did low-carb 
or meat-based eating change my life use hashtag ilcow 2023 or you can help those surrounding you in your area to do it as well so how to do low carb or how to do carnivore how to do meat-based eating in your locality and hashtag ilcow 2023 to help promote healthier lifestyle as what you said it's one of the most superior kind of diet that any person can actually do because that's what i also tell my patients and my friends if you compare yourself to a plant and compare yourself to a cow we are actually more of a cow than a plant so of course you would want to nourish yourself with something that you are similar with and that's just a very basic idea but it is also being supplemented and supported by scientific studies, unbiased scientific studies of the benefits of meat-based nutrition for better health. Any last words, Dr. Sean, before we end? Well, I just think, um, I think it's very important for you guys to, again, um, I tell this to everybody, you've got to take care of your own health. I mean, don't outsource it to somebody else, get involved, you know, you know, critically, if someone's telling you something, critically evaluate it, test it on yourself, make sure you get the objective results that you want. Just don't blindly follow what your doctor tells you if you're not getting healthier, because, you know, it's, <laughs> they only spend a very short period of time with you. You have to live in that body every day of your life. So don't, don't outsource your, your health to somebody else. Take it, take uh, control and ownership over your own health and figure out what works for you. And it may be carnivore, it may be something else, but you know, it's, it's important that you, you assess these things and, and objectively test them out. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Sean. So we'll say goodbye for now. And we hope to see you all in this coming International Low Carb Awareness Week and in our communities and beyond. Thank you so much. Thank, bye bye, Dr.